government problem has been solved with government band-aid, which has been solved by government band-aid. So if you pull off government band-aid, you have three more broken band-aids underneath it that sometimes make things worse. The EPA was not meant to go out and, and harass Oregonians and, and murder o Oregonians. What you're inferring is, you know what? If we legalize heroin tomorrow, everybody's going to use heroin. How many people here would use heroin if it was legal? I bet nobody would put the hand, oh yeah, I need the government to take care of me. I don't want to use heroin, so I need these laws. Ladies and gentlemen, how are you all doing? Welcome to the Logan for Liberty podcast. I'm coming at you from the Pacific Northwest, where the sun shines so bright only to rain just a few hours later. I hope you are all doing fantastic today. I have a very special show. Not really. This show will be a little more coordinated or structured than the last show, which was basically just me rambling. I believe this is the 13th podcast of the Logan for Liberty podcast. Um, today I want to talk about a story coming out of Baylor University that is just a massive slap to the face of uh, the diversity crowd on college campuses, which if we're not careful, I do think it will kind of transcend into other areas. It's sort of taken hold in certain aspects of news media. Um, entertainment, and college, education. A little bit of high school, but for the most part, uh, most small town high schools tend to be more localized. But first off, I want to talk about a story. Obviously, a story. I can't have a Logan for Liberty podcast if I'm not ranting about the state. So, there was a young mom who was justified in shooting an intruder. Okay, but get this, they're getting her on unlawful possession of a weapon. Now, at, at surface level, if you know nothing about the story, that seems pretty bad. Why does she have a gun if she's not supposed to? Well, here's the catch. Here is the thing that changes the entire story. Well, I mean, already you hear that the mother is justified in shooting the intruder to protect her baby who's barely even a year old, and the story was written on August 31st, just so we're clear. This mother's name is Chrissy Noble, maybe you've heard of it. It's kind of a weak old story, but I don't see left-wing media covering it in the light that it should. And it just seems like it's one of those things that the conservative media kind of glosses over. You know, they don't really take take these and make these stories take precedence over other events. Sometimes conservatives fall into that simple trap of, you know, trying to get ratings and viewers. And I understand you have to make money. You have to pay all the people you have, but at the same time, you have to live within your means. Anyway, that doesn't matter. So at first, when you hear the story, when you hear the part that the mother was justified in shooting the intruder to save her kid. Okay. That's fine. And then you find out that she wasn't allowed to own a firearm. You're like, oh, well, okay, maybe that's not so. That's that's not the way I interpreted it with the initial fact that the shooting was justified. But the reason why this young woman... Well, let me just read the story because it's ridiculous. A young woman who killed an intruder may be heading to prison even now that authorities have ruled the shooting justified. In December... Chrissy Noble shot a man named Dylan Stankoff with her husband's gun. So it's her husband's gun, not her own. But with uh, the way laws are in Arkansas, especially Fort Smith, Arkansas, um, probably a little bit of federal laws too, I would assume. No, I don't think there's any federal laws. It's state laws. We'll, we'll, we'll continue. Um... When Stankoff forced his way into her Fort Smith, Arkansas home, Noble was 11 weeks pregnant at the time. 
The case was sent to the Sebastian County Prosecutor's Office, which determined that the shooting was justified. Something I went over. But Noble still faces felony gun charges because of a previous drug-related conviction. In 2017, Noble pleaded guilty to felony possession of marijuana with intent to deliver as well as possession of drug paraphernalia. Basically, she had been pulled over in a vehicle while riding with friends. And each person in the vehicle had marijuana and received... Well, no, no. Each person in the vehicle received the same charges, but nobody claimed responsibility for the marijuana charges. So it's not even clear that this specific mother had any marijuana, but that's beside the point. She got a five-year suspended sentence, and as a part of that was prohibited from either possessing or using firearms. <clears throat> This is just amazing to me. After Stankoff's death, the authorities filed a petition to revoke Noble's suspended sentence. She has since been charged with being a convicted felon in possession of a gun. Yesterday, Noble turned herself in, was booked, and was released on a $2,500 bond. Noble gave birth to her son earlier this year. If convicted, she tells ABC News, she could spend a maximum of 24 years in prison. That's my baby's life, she lamented. I won't even know my child. Here's the thing, okay? Fine. Let's say you are the biggest proponent of the drug war and the most anti-marijuana advocate out there. You really champion the cause of punishing people, being tough on pot smokers. Okay, fine. But there's no way that this is completely a misuse and excessive use of the law of authority against an individual who is protecting herself. She, In reality, she's only being punished for protecting herself. Simply because the gun that she wasn't allowed to have possession of or use wasn't even her gun. It was her husband's gun. And according to the case, the husband was legally allowed to own the gun, had the legal right to own a gun, didn't have any convictions at all. So what was this mother supposed to do? Uh, 11 weeks pregnant. What, what was she supposed to do? I want to know. For anybody, who's, for anybody who would possibly support this, please help me out. What was she supposed to do? I mean, I know there's some left-wing advocates out there who, who would think that having a firearm <laughs> is unfair for the intruder. Hello, that's the point. Anyway, what was Nicole, or uh, sorry, Chrissy Noble supposed to do? I know I asked that like five times, but I, this is a genuine inquire, inquiry. Inquiry? This was this is a genuine inquiry. Was she supposed to just lay down and uh, let Dylan Stankoff intrude into her private property? Would it have been better if she defended herself with a knife, uh, an eleven-week-old pregnant woman versus versus a man? I'm genuinely curious. But, but the law is the law. She shouldn't have broken it. Even though she had no choice because somebody else was breaking the law. This is just... This is a misuse of justice. It's unbelievable to me that this is even a thing. I don't... I hope she's not convicted. Y you know what I mean? It's... Well, what... This makes me so frustrated. I'm at a loss of words for it. I just can't describe it. She's really being punished for defending herself. Because these charges never would have happened if somebody didn't intrude into her private property and pose a threat to her that the police, the authorities, even said was a justified shooting. So, I want to get into a lighter note. Which will probably still lead me to rant. Um, so there's this article published by Reason Magazine. Now this isn't 
Reason Magazine is saying that they support this. This is just them reporting. Did I say report this? It doesn't mean they support this. They are just reporting on these two coaches that have what I would consider an offbeat idea for coaching. Now, I love sports. I'm a huge sports advocate. I think more kids should play sports, preferably football, but whether it is football, soccer, volleyball, basketball, wrestling, baseball, track, cross country, swimming, you name it. I don't care. Play sports. It's incredibly healthy for you to get out and move. It increases motor function. There's a lot of benefits to sports, but these two coaches who are professors at Bowling Green State University, which is a university in Ohio. And in case you don't know, um, they played my Oregon Ducks last week and got absolutely hammered. Let me... Was it Bowling Green? Let, let me look up what the score was. They, they, they were winning maybe the first quarter and then my, my Oregon Ducks caught up. Let me see. Um... Oregon Ducks football schedule. So I got a real delight out of this story simply because they are from Bowling Green. And uh, for some reason, the story stuck with me. Not only that, it, it, it's kind of a radical story, if you ask me. All right. Let's see. Will they play Stanford on the 22nd? Yeah, Bowling Green. Uh, what's the score? 58 to 24? Yeah, you got wrecked, Bowling Green. Hope you're lit. You're out there listening to this if you're from Ohio or Bowling. Although, is Bowling Green... I'm sorry, we're taking this little tangent <laughs> into uh, college sports here for no reason. But the title of this article is We Don't Need Soccer Moms or Dads or Coaches. Uh, yeah, they're in the fo football bowl subdivision, so they're division one. Damn, I feel bad for them. Anyway, without further ado, let us get started. Let us continue down this path. So, there's these two language professors from Bowling Green State University, which explains the nature of this article, and you will know exactly what I am talking about. And I will come at it, I will steal man their position and come at it from an empathetic point of view. So, between the two of them, Carlo Selly and Nathan Richardson, both language professors at Bowling Green State University in Ohio, have coached youth soccer for about 30 years. Sweet, right? Actually, they say that they were doing it all wrong. The problem isn't that they were coaching improperly, it's that they were coaching, period. Okay, fine. All kids really need to learn the game, Richardson says. Now is a ball, a place to play, and some older kids to play with them. Instead, we have delivered them into the soccer industrial complex, a top-down, adult-run, structured, supervised system that drains all the joy out of the game and not coincidentally all the creative genius. Sully and Richardson submit that the reason the U.S. men's professional soccer team was knocked out of the World Cup contention so early was that we're raising soccer robots. Well, not to be literal here, but if they were probably robots, in like the sense that we'd understand a robot playing an athletic sport, the robot would probably whoop the human's ass. They won't get exhausted. They won't feel pain. They won't have any emotions. They won't fatigue. They won't need more nutrition or sustenance like water. So the robots would probably win. So your analogy sucks. Now you could say something like soccer zombies. Or soccer slaves. I don't know. I guess I'm reading too literally into an analogy. Anyway, they didn't always feel that way. For a long time, the two men happily put local kids through their drills starting as young as age three. Then one morning, two of their nine-year-old players showed up to practice with their younger sisters and one brought along another kid who hadn't played soccer before. The day was shot. They just have to let everyone goof off. The kids proceeded to do just that, running around like puppies and making up moves. They laughed and yelped, and when the hour was up, they didn't want to go home. Sully and Richardson saw something 
they hadn't witnessed since their own childhoods. Kids who weren't practicing the game, they were playing it. Uh, I'll talk about that later. I don't want to interject now. And that, they realized, is the key to get good at a game. Kids need to play it. And adults need to get out of the way. So they stopped interfering and saw their players improve week by week. Their new book, Shoeless Soccer, Fixing the System and Winning the World Cup, Carlo Selly. Which, by the way, I'm probably going to buy this book and read. Just because it intrigues me. And I'll explain why later. Again, I am interjecting. And, uh... Oh, yeah, it's inspired by, uh... Oh, okay, so let me keep going. So not only is it inspired by their players just playing soccer one day, imagine that, it's uh, inspired by a guy named Pele, Pele, or Pele, the greatest soccer player of all time who is known as the shoeless one. He grew up so poor in Brazil that he played in the street without footwear or even a ball. He used a sock filled with rags. The solution is not to take away our children's shoes, but when kids play on the streets rather than grass, the game is faster, the reflexes get quicker. Same thing when they play with a bunch of different sized balls or in a smaller space, and if somehow they do end up barefoot, they will immediately learn to kick properly. Because if you strike the ball with your toes, you will howl in pain. But most importantly, without coaches yelling and a trophy on the line, kids are free to improvise just like Pile. We've been getting this wrong from the beginning. America didn't used to be a soccer country. When we finally began to pay attention to the game, it was via TV watching championships. You see a giant screen, grassy field with referees and coaches and players on the bench. It looks like it is this elaborate thing, says Richardson. But soccer is really the simplest game imaginable. The infrastructure should be incredibly minimalist. We assumed our kids needed uniforms, cleats, shin guards, and of course, a whole lot of adult involvement. Eventually, that translated into an expensive proposition. Youth sports are now a $15 billion industry, and one that eats up the ch all the child's free time. The amount of travel the kids do these days to play in sports is insane, says Sally. Kids are spending more time in the car than actually playing the game. The pair's solution is as simple as it is radical. Give soccer back to the kids, at least through middle school, and let mixed ages play together. Simple, right? But there's a problem. Send your kids out to kick around a ball old school, and they might not find anyone to play with because everyone else is off at an adult-led practice. So the key is to get local parks and rec departments to offer a more shoeless version of the game. Dial back the trophies and travel, send the parents off to get a coffee, or better still, have the kids arrive by bike, and then let them play like Pile. So, uh... I know I'm taking this too seriously, but this is more of a cultural issue than it is a political issue. And as somebody who likes sports, and you as somebody who is tuning into the Logan for Liberty podcast, one of the things I like as Logan is sports. Um, I'm not necessarily the biggest soccer fan, um, but I, you know, I don't hate soccer. I respect it. I'm not good at soccer. Um, therefore, I'm not going to say it's a talentless sport. and it, it is a simple sport. They have absolutely a point. So, I'm not going to tackle this in order. I just want to talk about it. This seems more like a postmodernist type move. Sort of. Or, I don't know, an anti-institutional move. Tearing down the systems. So, first of all, they say that, uh, you know, if you send your kids to kick around an old ball... An old school, you know, kick around soccer in an old school way, just playing for fun. They might not find anybody to play with because everyone else is at an, an adult-led practice. Well, first of all, I don't know how it is in your town, but typically we have fall sports, we have winter sports, and we have spring sports. In the fall, for men, we have soccer, football, well, for men, we have football. Girls can be on it, but, you know, it's typically men. It's considered men's sports. But we also... So, so okay, fall, we have volleyball, football. Um, is it cross-country? What is Cross-country. Uh, football. Sorry, I, I got distracted. Football, volleyball, cross-country. Okay, fair enough. Oh, soccer. Soccer. We also have soccer in the fall. 
And then in the winter, we have basketball and wrestling. And then in the spring, we have swimming, baseball, softball, track, maybe tennis, and so on. So, when, depending on the school, you might have indoor soccer, which is a sort of more minimalized game of soccer, like a regular outside soccer. So, you're telling me all year round these kids can't find somebody to play with? Not to mention that, but the reason why you practice soccer is so you can compete and play with kids from a rival school. And depending on the town that you live in, sometimes these rival schools are in different towns. So, for example, here on the West Coast, in my county, we have three schools. We have a school in our North County, our Middle County, which is also the seat of our county, and our county is named after this town. And then we have South County. North County and South County play each other because they're both 2A in Oregon Athletic Association sports. Um, the school that I played for in my main town, they're 4A school. So typically, you know, they don't... The main town doesn't play North or South County. I mean, sometimes they'll play North County... The younger teams will because, you know, they're younger kids, so it doesn't really matter. No team really has an edge, although our team did somehow. Anyway, regardless, uh, uh, to continue on that point, the whole point of playing competitive soccer is to play against other people, to compete with other people. The whole point of practice is to get better. Sure, this one soccer player who's probably maybe one of the greatest soccer players ever, again, I have no idea. I don't follow soccer that much. I'm not against it. Um, I can understand it when I'm watching it. It's just not something that really intrigues me. It's not something that I dedicate time into. I love football and I don't really dedicate that much time into football. I can explain football, the game, in theory. I can explain Canadian football. I can explain indoor football. I can explain... Some aspects of rugby because it's that similar to football. And I could probably, for the most part, explain soccer. Regardless, just playing the game doesn't make you better. I mean, this is a whole confusing thing anyway. It's saying that we should give it back to the kids. Yeah, you should give it back to the kids, but you also want to structure it for them in a way. If these kids want to play soccer old school style, they can. They can do it outside of practice or they can do it when the season ends. And then they can play. They can play all they want. But for the most part, there's there's no monopoly on soccer. As a matter of fact, um, during lunch at, in high school, um, a lot of the soccer players would go outside on the field and play soccer. They weren't just, you know, playing is practicing, practicing is playing, but there's drills that you have to go through to get better at form, to get better at speed, and to get better at all, at all sorts of things, get better at coordination, and sometimes you need to actually run through the drills so you have a base to then transfer over to playing. And this is something that anybody who plays football understands. You don't just get out and play football, and to be fair, Football's more strategic than soccer. Um, but you don't just get out and play football. No, you have to practice. You have to drill. You have to get better at speed, strength, stamina. You have to get better at form. So, in a cultural way, this makes no sense taking out the structure for kids. Now, that being said, you shouldn't stop them from, go, from going and playing soccer. And there, it's okay to have... A certain day where maybe you don't take practice as seriously as the others. You have a pretty light day. You bring your friends. You just play soccer. Because after all, that's what it's all about. But this is an organized competition. There is no law that says you can't play soccer outside of this organized competition. This is why this article, not this article, but these two coaches are baffling to me. Because why would you take out the organized structure? Now, I, um, I understand, you know, where they're coming from because I don't know if you guys have seen the TV show Friday Night Tykes, but it's basically youth football and these coaches treat them like they are high school students. 
like they are high school athletes or even college athletes. I think that's a little too far. Like, I'm empathetic to where these people are coming from because kids need to have fun and kids need to, have, need to play. They definitely need freedom. And I'm not against giving these kids that freedom, but these kids need a structure. They need a framework so they at least know that there is a necessity to have some sort of structure or framework in which they should organize either practice, um, sometimes play, or just structure in general like working as a team. Um, playing definitely does make you better, but so does practicing and so does drills. Um, I know that was kind of off topic, but, um, this is my podcast. I talk about whatever the hell it is I want. So that's the only story I want to talk about from that stack. There's another story, which is the main one that I want to talk about, which is actually a study. Again, for this podcast, my sources are Reason Magazine, simply because I have, you know, uh, less research for me, because Reason Magazine does my research for me, because Reason Magazine already answers all the questions that I want. No, I'm kidding. I have a stack of BBC News articles. Um, Even if I'm not planning on doing podcasts, I do have a stack of articles, I like to print out articles on paper, and it costs, you know, I use a lot of ink, I use a lot of paper, but as far as I know, there is some science to prove that reading on paper is much better, plus I get less distracted, I'm less tempted to open up different tabs. So, uh, you know, um, for the beginning of September, I got, I printed a bunch of Articles from Reason Magazine, and I printed a bunch of articles from BBC News, because BBC News, as we all know, it's not a left-wing, or a right-wing, or libertarian type of organization. I also have a study that I printed out, because I thought it was interesting, and I want to read it, and I want to have the hard copy. I also have a bunch of stuff from the Ron Paul Institute for Peace and Prosperity, I have articles going back to August, and then I have a collection of articles written by Ron Paul and Matt Welch from Reason Magazine. So I like paper. Reading on paper makes me feel a lot better. I'm able to retain information more. I'm able to focus better, so that's why there's that. That was a weird tangent to go on, to go off on. Huh. (laughs) <laughs> anyway, um, so there's this study that comes out of Baylor University, and this study cracks me up. By the way, did you know that um, oftentimes the chief diversity officer of a campus, basically the person who's supposed to be in charge of making sure that we fill diversity quotas, and generally it's based on um, physical diversity, skin color, more so than it is based on intellectual diversity. But at the University of Michigan, by the way, which isn't at the front of the social justice warrior movement, it th- this person makes almost $400,000 a year. At the University of Michigan, they make $396,000 a year. Is that not insane? Imagine... Imagine this at any of the other universities in the United States that are at the front, that are the bedrock for these social justice warrior, um, uh, pseudo postmodernists. I don't know if pseudo would be the right, right word. Um, by the way, I understand the difference between postmodernism and. The social justice warriors. The, jo- the social justice warriors are an outgrowth of postmodernism, though. Even if postmodernists aren't social justice warriors. It, 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 anyway, that's a whole topic that we can go on. So, well, if I read the title, it'll give it away. So, let's read the article. Campus Diversity SARS... SARS? SARS. Uh, Sorry, I've been watching too much Interstellar. Hey. All right, all right, all right. Anyway, um, campus diversity czars frequently draw massive salaries. The University of Michigan's chief diversity officer, for example, 
rakes in $396,000 a year. Is that money well spent? Probably not. A new study went looking for evidence that employing a chief diversity official produced a more diverse faculty and came back empty-handed. We are unable to find significant statistical evidence that pre-existing growth in diversity for underrepresented racial ethnic minority groups, basically uh, physical diversity, is affected by the hiring of an executive level diversity officer. Write the study's authors, a team of researchers associated with Baylor University. The team looked at the data from 2001 through to 20,000, or sorry, 20,000, 2016. Over that period of time, universities hired a lot of chief diversity officers, but this did not correlate with diversity related faculty hiring. Possibly sensing that these findings will likely offend many administrators, lead author Stephen Bradley defended the research in an interview with Insider Higher Education. He stressed that he wasn't saying diversity czars are bad for diversity, just that he couldn't produce any evidence that they were good for. I'll get into that later because that quote piques my interest. There's something hilarious about it. We believe more work must be done to better understand barriers to increased diversity and how they might be best addressed. The study concludes. Note that this study looked only at racial and ethnic diversity. Fostering intelligent, uh, sorry, intellectual diversity is not generally part of a campus diversity officer's job description, as I said earlier. So let me go with uh, this First, not first, but the four, fifth paragraph in the article that says um, Stephen Bradley, who was the lead author of this research in an interview, basically stressed that uh, he wasn't saying diversity czars are bad for diversity, just that he couldn't produce any evidence that they were good for it, which to me is an amazing thing to say. It's an amazing thing to sinuate. All the study said was that there was no evidence that hiring a chief of a chief diversity officer helped diversity. It didn't insinuate that it was bad for diversity, at least in the way that they want it. So to me, that is amazing that he would even have to say that or feel that he would have to say that. What's the point? The data you produced... And by the way, I encourage you to read the study. The title is called New Study Finds Zero Evidence That Hiring a Chief Diversity Officer Produces More Diversity on Campus from Reason Magazine. Um, and it's hyperlinked so you can read the sources that this article is drawing from, especially Inside Higher Education or Inside Higher Ed. Um... If you find zero evidence to say that it helps, it's not saying... That it's worse for diversity. So that's what kind of piques my interest. Because it's it's kind of funny. Or that's what stands out the most. It's kind of funny that he would have to say that. Why would you have to say that? You know, it's it's unbelievable. Um, yeah, you couldn't produce any evidence that they were good for it. Maybe the only bad thing is is that you're paying an individual almost $400,000 a year to do nothing. Not only that, but the wrong type of diversity, which is just physical difference diversity. Basically, not, not, not physical difference, just uh, skin color difference. Maybe nationality. And then the quote that says, we believe more work must be done to better understand barriers to increase diversity and how they might be addressed. The study concludes. Um, so isn't it amazing that you can dedicate a study looking at a period of 15, 16 years and then conclude that we need more information to understand uh, what affects diversity and what, uh, what barriers there are to diversity? I mean, I can think of... A few at the top of my head. Although I'm not saying I don't want this studied. I just don't want this studied by an ideological clown. Somebody who's going to see numbers and then try to apply his worldview in those numbers to explain it. Because sometimes statistics are have no emotional impact. 
There's an interesting chapter in Ron Paul's Liberty Defined about statistics that I want to go over, but I don't have it with me and I don't want to dig through all my papers to find it. But it, it was actually a really interesting article, which I think, not article, but chapter, which I think will shine some light on things. Nonetheless, though, um, I could think of a couple reasons at the top of my head of why there's not an increased diversity. A, you're concentrating on the wrong type of diversity. B, there might be a cultural difference between some of these people that you're trying to hire in. Maybe, or trying to uh, um, recruit, but maybe they don't, they, they don't want to go to college. Maybe cultural norms um, on both sides. Maybe human nature. Or any host of things. Or maybe uh, what's represented in college is the statistical proportion of real life. I don't know. But uh, you don't need to pour money into the type of research. What you know is, is that you're paying somebody $400,000 to take care of diversity a year. But uh, you're not producing any meaningful results. None. None whatsoever. Zero. It, they didn't say they found minimal evidence. They said they found... No evidence. Now, listen, um, I think if you wanted to have diversity quotas, you should do diversity in the right way. You should look at intellectual diversity. So, for instance, if I was hired as a diversity officer, I would say, okay, well, this isn't the, diver the diversity I'm looking for. I don't care if you're black, white, or Asian, or you come from South America. Here's what I'm looking for in diversity. So let's say we have five major political parties in the United States. We have the Republican Party, we have the Democratic Party, we have the Libertarian Party, the Green Party, the Independent Party. So my goal would maybe to, I don't know, uh, have quotas, maybe some quotas based on political party leanings. So, like, part of the application process would be maybe intellectual diversity quota or intellectual diversity application. And we have a, a whole host of questions. For example, what political party are you from? I'm not saying this is something I want. I'm just saying that this is something that is a far better, be better, better, better alternative than racial and ethnic diversity. What political party do you belong to? Okay, fill in the gaps. We need a certain amount of independent people that identify as independents, that identify as Greens, that identify as Republicans, Democrats, Libertarians. Okay, fine. All right, now let's look. Um, communist, Socialist, Keynesian, um, and Capitalist. What, what, what do you consider yourself? Okay, boom, quarters, right there. We get... 25% of this quota to be capitalist, 25, socialist, communist, Keynesians. Even undecideds. That's fine. All right, cool. Um, uh, what do you consider your political ideology? Do you, are you an anarcho-capitalist? You know, so on and so forth. Stuff like that. That's just political. What sports do you, what, what's your most favorite sport? Oh, football? Okay, we need a certain amount of people like football, basketball, Baseball, so on. Maybe IQ tests. We allow IQ tests. You know, there's there's so many ways that we can have intellectual diversity. There's so many questions. Do you believe in God? Yes or no? Simple. Okay. Are you a religious person? Are you spiritual? Are you atheist? Or are, are you agnostic? Or are you an anti-theist? There you go. That's intellectual diversity right there. That's a... That's a huge thing. That is one of the most existential questions of our time. Is there God? And let's say you are religious. Okay. Are you a Christian, a Muslim, a Jew? Are you, you don't know, you just believe in God? Or are you an atheist? No, I mean, well, if you are religious, are you one of these? Or, or other, of course. There you go. You have another standard. To increase intellectual diversity. Do you believe in 
global climate change? Yes or no? Boom, there's one. Do you believe that climate change is a man-made issue? Or man-made? Boom, there's one. How much of a threat do you see on a scale from 1 to 10 global climate change? There you go. You just opened up 10 different tiers of intellectual diversity. You could have a, on a scale from 1 to 10, do you think diversity, into, or um, ethnic and uh, racial diversity is important? On a scale from 1 to 10, how important do you think it is? There you go. 10 tiers. Do you, um, on a scale from 1 to 10, how do you view religion as a threat? There you go. 10 tiers. On a scale from 1 to 10, how do you see athletics being an important... Or how important do you think athletics are in the development of a child? 1 to 10. 10 different tiers. On a scale from 1 to 10, uh, how do you feel about getting rid of football in high school because of concussions or X, Y, and Z? There, there's just so many questions that you can go through in an application... And then you have all these numbers for intellectual diversity rather than racial and ethnic diversity if they actually cared about diversity. Now, I would rather just let the ranks fill themselves, the most qualified people get in there. But if I were in the position or had to say we need something, we need to do something about diversity, I would urge the college, the university, the education establishment to go down this specific way. We want intellectual diversity. Stop worrying about ethnic and racial. Maybe I may, may, maybe you can have a part in there for racial and ethnic diversity. What nationality are you? We can have a certain uh, area to where, yeah, we hired or we recruit the best people within those areas. I get that. That's fine. That's 100% fine, I guess. As long as that's not your sole focus on intellectual diversity. Already a university on its own should have intellectual diversity. Especially one that has not only everything under STEM, science, mathematics, engineering, technology. Wait, wait, uh, uh, science, technology, engineering, mathematics. And then you mix that in with the social sciences. You mix that in with natural science. You should already have intellectual diversity, but at least you have another tier of diversity that you can then incorporate into your student body. I don't support it, like I said, but at least you're getting your $4,000. At least you're, that's four, $4,000, $400,000 somewhat well spent because you actually got a diversity of thought. Who did you vote for in the 2016 election? Who would you have voted for in the 2016 election? Who are you going to vote for in this next up and coming election? <coughs> you know what I mean? That's just that's just me anyway. I went on a tangent. I guess I lost the structure. I mean, I talked about two different things. I talked about sports. Talked about a mother who's probably going to be convicted for protecting her child, essentially. Although I know the crime is unlawful possession and use of a firearm because of some marijuana charge. Regardless, this is Logan for Liberty. I am signing out for the day. I hope you have a good one.